Hello, friends. It's Monday, September 11th. This is your Chapo coming out. You hope everyone is having a wonderful 9-11. Um, and, you know, just dancing, 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 dancing. That's what people do on 9-11. And it's what's trending on Twitter right now. <laughs> Sometimes you want to cut, a, cut loose, foot loose. Kick off your Friday shoes. <laughs> We're just talking before we uh, started recording today. And I feel like... Um, uh, we we have ended up recording on nine eleven like a, a number of episodes, like a number of uh, Mondays, you know. But um, you, you know, the original one happened on a Tuesday. But uh, I mean, it is back. sort of the ultimate Monday, so <laughs> yeah, it's fitting, you know. Oh boy, yeah, it's it's the Monday of American civilization, and we hate it. Garfield, he hates nine eleven. Yep. But uh, I hope everyone's uh, doing good, um, having fun. I guess I'd like to begin today. Did you guys see? The uh, the list of the most popular kinks rated by state, according to FetLife.com. I was I yeah. was personally very, very disappointed <laughs> well, and well, annoyed we to that. I want to get to uh, each of our each of our home states and uh, some of some of the better results here. This is uh, this is like disproportionately the, the highest searches for specific kinks and fetishes by state from the uh, website FetLife, uh, beginning with uh, my home state of New York. A uh, number one fetish, human ashtray, human ashtray, which mm. I think is very, I think it's very fitting for New York, you know, because it's, it's uh, the city's dirty. Well, like, uh, how do they know that it's like a kink search? <laughs> because like, like I, I could, I mean, I searched for that a number of times while I was living in New York myself, but not for sexual reasons. I just, you were just searching. I for just a wanted service. one. Yeah, yeah. You just wanted one. Yeah. Just somebody to come out and extend his hands for me to just put my cigarette out in it. Yeah, I wanted like a, a drifter who I could humiliate. <laughs> not in this, not sexual style. No, just, no, I'm not a bad person. No. Yeah. Yeah. No, me. Most of the people when I lived in the Upper West Side, most of the people in my building had one of those. <laughs> and I thought, oh, just a guy who followed them behind around. Yeah. Right behind them. Yeah. A lot of guys. Yeah. A lot of guys would empty their pipes into his mouth. Mm. You know, I, I, I've had I've had so many problems with traditional ashtrays, you know, containing all of the ashes and whatnot. And I think a human ashtray is the way to go. They, they won't they won't spill a drop if you ash in their mouth, in their hands or just, you know, just put something, put a cigarette out on them. But, yeah, I, I remember as a kid growing up, like an arts and crafts class, you know, my parents didn't smoke, but I still I brought them home a human ashtray and they'd be like, what the fuck am I going to do with this? Um, of course, okay, moving on to uh, Felix, Illinois, y- your home state. The number one fetish in Illinois is business suits. <laughs> business suits. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. So, like, how, what is their methodology here? Are they getting like top results they search for, like on Pornhub or Fet it's Life? Just, no, this is, uh, this is, this is based on how disproportionately users from that state like, like that kink when compared to other states. Oh, okay. So like, this is, I th- heard a similar thing about Iran that their top porn search term was like hotel businessman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, remember that. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Which is yeah. like, you know, suggests that like, you know, for 20 years, there was one porno circulating in all of Iran <laughs> and it just depicted like a guy in hotel, like having sex could be a similar thing. Or maybe we're just, as I've always thought, a state of go-getters. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't see you at the club. Well, I don't see you at the bank fucking someone in a business suit. <laughs> I always think about like those fetishes, like, you know, how it would be kind of good to be a foot fetishist because just like, you know, if you live in a warm climate or even if you, you know, you just watch a lot of TV, there are a lot of feet out there. It's true. There's a lot of material. Yeah. But like, if you're a business suit guy, oh my God, all you have to do is just get an office job. Well, not now, (laughs) not now. I mean, now you better be like a, a, a vest fetishist. (laughs) <laughs> but like, well, that's just it. nobody's wearing yeah. them anymore. Yeah, like you yeah, get, no, no. You used COVID to, you has destroyed the business suit fetish community. At least yeah. in the old days, you could go to the airport and see people who dressed up to to fly somewhere. Now everybody just dresses like a pig, including myself. So you're never even going to see a cool suit at the airport. Even just some guy in a fucking NFL jersey of some kind, covered in <laughs> mustard. Yeah, it used to be everyone put on a suit to fly. Now, yeah, the only people who like put on a suit to fly, it's someone who like the just pilot. killed both their parents. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the pilot, and that yeah. they usually they, a lot of times they don't even have a, a coat on that thing. It's just a, yeah, like a, 
short sleeve shirt. Get the fuck out of here. Okay, yeah, but like if you were a business suit guy in like, you know, 2000. Oh, yeah. Then it's like amazing, probably. You know, like uh, here, here in New York, there's all kinds of like, you know, uh, mournful warnings about like uh, all this commercial real estate going unused because of all this, yeah. like, you know, office spaces that's unleased. I think the city of Chicago should get on it and like have some sort of uh, like Sarah McLaughlin in a plaintive tone talking about like for just three cents a day, you can. You can fill these corridors with uh, hot men and women in business suits for you to jack off to. Yeah, like uh, there, it, there's a dearth of it. Everyone in Chicago is wearing like a Chicago Bears burlap sack <laughs> that just says <laughs> zero zero football on the back. I wonder if like if you're a business suit fetishist, if like the more intricate the suit, like the hotter it is. Like, right. If you like see... what's the criteria? Like, well, are you, I mean, like, do you get harder for like wider lapels? Like, is that it, like right. a big dick? Do you want smaller lapels? It's more yeah, classy. Yeah, if, if you were watching like Mad Men and you see a three piece suit, is that just like seeing like huge tits? Yeah, mm. I don't know. I just uh, think it's, it's sort. Of, I think it's sort of like I think I think business suit is maybe like adjacent to teacher or nurse in that like I think it's uh, guys who want women it, it to sort of embody a, a some sort of professional position of authority over them. Mm, yes, so like an eighties video, she takes the glasses off. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. I do yeah. wonder, though, if they have their own, like, yeah, are there perverts within the pervert community? Like, the people who are really into those giant, baggy 90s suits? Like, you're a pervert if you like that. I'm sorry. Uh, Even amongst the suit people. That's a terrible look. They caught me tr uh, trading tapes of the 1999 NBA draft. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting sent to federal prison because I tried to download Shaquille O'Neal on draft day on public Wi-Fi. <laughs> uh, Matt, I will I will get to your home state, but I I, I do I would like to note that um, right next to Illinois, the state of Indiana, uh, their their most uh, preferred fetish is just cum lynching. <laughs> just cum. Yeah. The, oh, the, the, yeah. Simple people. The, yeah, yeah. There's a couple of states that are like, okay, this is where the normal people still live, and it's Ass. Indiana with cum. <laughs> yeah. West Virginia is just big tits. It's like yeah. that's right, West Virginia. <laughs> Yeah. No need to get all fancy Country about roads, it. Roads, take me home. Yep, to those big jugs or where I belong. Just give me some dang hooters, okay? Mount, Mountain Mama, talk about that. Indiana is come, but uh, Matt, please, please, please account for Wisconsin's oh, number one fetish: diapers. So diapers, oh. come <laughs> on, people! You're making me look bad here. Diapers, and the thing is, if you look at any map of uh, binge drinking in America, and more specifically, public drinking in America, and this is the important part. It's Wisconsin. Wisconsin oh, doesn't yeah. necessarily drink much more than the rest of this alcoholic country. The difference is, is that there is more public consumption of alcohol in Wisconsin. There's a disproportionate number of bars that people go to to drink. Like New Hampshire has a similar level of I binge drinking. I just saw that. But they all just stay in their disgust, their hovels and drink it alone like the insane Puritans that they're descended from. Yeah. Like I just saw that. The was like, witch with a fucking a fifth of Jameson. But in Wisconsin, you go out and drink. And if you're out of the bar club. all night and you break the seal, what do you got to do <laughs> yeah. keep from having to go home? And that is slap out a diaper. If you got to go to Lambeau Field and you've had 15 beers before they open the gates, how are you going to watch the game without missing the action? Motherfucking diaper. So they just incorporated it into the, the sexual realm. In the realm of the senses. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, no, actually, I just saw that about New Hampshire, that they have Wisconsin level drinking, but like they have they the just are all doing it alone. They have the least amount of bars of, and of like, you know, per square mile uh, yep. than any state in America. Yeah, it's all about it, it's all about how alcohol is incorporated into your culture. And in uh, Wisconsin really is the only place in the country I'm aware of that has a open, publicly affirmed culture of alcoholism, where alcoholism is a positive social trait to have and is reinforced that way. We, it, I think that's unique in that respect. Is this the cultural legacy of the of the party Germans? The party the Germans, indeed. Yeah. The, the Catholic mm -hmm. Southern Germans, the Bavarian types. They came in and they said, fuck all this noise. We just want to grill and get shit faced. And they have done so for about uh, 200 years now. God bless them. Uh, it's yeah. No, it's amazing. Yeah. There's just less public stigma on being drunk. There's less public stigma on drinking a lot every night. And so more people are willing to do it in front of others instead of trying to hide it from them, their families, their friends, and also from the people who call and ask how much they drink, which is why you have like these maps where nobody drinks in the Bible Belt. Okay, sure. 
They're lying. <laughs> yeah. Um, I gotta say, I've talked to you about this before, Matt, but like since since becoming sort of I don't know, semi Wisconsin adjacent, I really do appreciate the Wisconsin supper club culture, and I think that that oh, should baby. be ex- that should be expanded. I think I think the other states really need to get on to this supper club lifestyle. It's it's a really it's Folks, a pleasant innovation of, of bringing together both bar and sort of casual dining and gambling. Okay, so you saunter into the the, the supper club. It will be covered in some sort of uh, some sort of fur on the walls or uh, wood paneling, but it will be darkly lit. This is very important. Nice leather banquette type tables. Oh and yeah, you, and a nice bar that you sit in for about forty five minutes to an hour before you are seated and have two or three cocktails. Not beers, cocktails, because you're going out. It's a night on the town. You don't drink beer. beers for literally every other minute. Of the beer day. don't get you drunk. Beer don't get you, you drunk. Get, That's you, just you know what you order. You order a brandy old fashioned, the state yep. beverage of Wisconsin, which is an old fashioned. And you're like, what about bre- what? Bre- yes, that's right. With brandy, it's sweet as hell. Uh, and it, it is the reason that Wisconsin accounts for this is true. Eighty percent of America's brandy consumption, because they're the only bar. There are only bars in the country that are pouring brandy old fashioned. So you have two no, or most three bars of those. in New York don't even stock brandy. Like, yes, you go back into the incredibly dimly lit dining area where there's big tables and, and banquettes and there's leather usually. And there's a salad bar with a bunch of different, you know, like very heavy dressings like, you know, Russians in there. You know, you're going to have like some sort of uh, bacon based vinaigrette, which one time I went into a supper club. And I, oh, yeah, I was a kid, <laughs> and I, I I saw this like bubbling cauldron with bacon in it, and I thought it was soup, so I put it in my soup bowl, and I got to the table. I'm like, this is way too salty, and they're like, yeah, that is a bacon vinaigrette salad dressing. <laughs> that's it. I, that's insane. I mean, and, like, who who would guess that? And then you order maybe like a platter of fried uh, shrimp, and then you get like a nice uh, room temperature prime rib or something like that, or a big f- uh, a hunk of. Uh, of a uh, cod or something, something from the lake, maybe that lake trout. And it's delightful. Yeah. It's, 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 it's like it's, dinner it's a really theater cool, where, uh, where the show experience. is replaced by alcohol. <laughs> yeah. Um, just, just a, a quick, a few more highlights from the, uh, from the, uh, the America, the state of fetish. Um, California's number one fetish is something called uh, decrypphilia. De- no, dacrophilia. What? Which you I thought fucking up. pretentious it, assholes. It's a fear. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a fetish. Uh, it refers to tears. It's people who have a fetish for tears and crying. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's Pizza sick. Gate was right. I apologize yeah. to Jack Posobiec. That's there's no way to explain that other than Hollywood, literal Hollywood sickos like Mason Verger getting the child tear to decorate his martini. Sickos. <laughs> yeah. Let, destroy the state, please. Break us off at this uh, fucking San Andreas fault. <laughs> Virginia has interrogation. This one for yeah. yeah. This, <laughs> this one for Nova, me. baby. <laughs> right yeah. on acres. That freaked me out the most. I mean, the California <laughs> one's like gross, but it's like you know you can kind of you kind of see it coming, right? It's right, like yeah, oh, yeah, very yeah, theatrical the, out there, right? The hottest thing to them is like a crying actress being like, "Please, I have to get this part," and then yeah. like. A, a sort of like mucinex shaped man uh, doing something <laughs> awful. But uh, for like interrogation, I never even entertained that as a possibility. Never occurred to me that that was a whole category. Yeah, they really take their work home. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Yeah. That's, mean, you know, I, if, you, uh, if, you, if you like what you do, you never work a day in your life. I think that's the way to treat uh, enhanced yeah. interrogations. Yeah. I, I like that. Uh, that there's interrogation and West Virginia's is big tits. Big t- that's right, baby. That's yeah. what happens when you secede from the South because you don't have enough <laughs> slaves to care. Yeah. Like, you guys go ahead and, and worship the, the death star of power. We'll be over here motorboating some big old titties in the hall. <laughs> <laughs> um, Re- Real quick. What, what's the Ohio? Yeah, what's Ohio's? Oh, Ohio. What yeah. about O-H-O-I-H-O? Oh, God, Ohio's guy. is sort of similar to New York's. Ohio's is smoking. <laughs> oh my god are they are they no. only pulling like uh, eight-year-olds like what the fuck i mean these are these are these are these are fet life what what you know users who are like you know in look this is uh, this is not a poll of like the, the state overall this is a poll of people this in the, the perverse community within each, within, within, within each state you know so it's not necessarily reflective of the broader character of the state but what yeah. i will say is that i think the lesson of these state-by-state fetishes is that each state takes its work home with them yes 
I will I will try to interrogate the uh, Ohio one psychologically. I think it's because, uh, you know, Ohio right across the river from Kentucky where, you know, real tobacco land starts. So it is close, but not exactly that. So, you know, what do you fetishize things that are nearby, but withheld a little bit of taboo? How so does across- one begin to covet? <laughs> <laughs> one covets, one, one sees every day. we things to covet? <laughs> That's no. what I like about the West Virginia thing is like you're like presumably you're already amount around like like minded fetishists and you you know you're either like a gross kinky married couple or just like a greasy sex guy and you're like oh I could like the most I can get into the most insane things here like things that I couldn't you know do with a normal partner big tits <laughs> you can't find, you can't find tits anywhere else but the fetish community. Uh, speaking of speaking of Kentucky, uh, another another normal state. Uh, Kentucky's number one fetish: panties. <laughs> Come panties. On, that is so innocent. Okay, yeah, yeah. they're all they're uh, okay, all freshman I, perverts over there. They just started out and being perverted. Uh, and then I gotta say, like, the, easily the lamest state with like the lamest dumbest fetish is is, is you know it would have to be the state of Oregon for their fetish: pirates. Oh God, that's oh, Portland for you, baby. Pirates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Portland, Portland. Before, before it was the, uh, the 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 barter town of Trump's America, Portland <laughs> was the epic bacon city. It was the it was the place where people went to do epic internet stuff and, yeah. and embody the epic internet life. Yeah, that's Philadelphia now, but mm-hmm. how easy we forget. Uh, Pennsylvania's is boot licking. It's it's uh, oh they like they they play gritty during the day but they bootlick the fash at night <laughs> that's what they're doing over there in Philadelphia, um so yeah that's that that's it for a breakdown of the uh, America's fetishes by state um all right next thing I want to talk about uh, the, the story happened over the weekend I'm just gonna ask you guys what the fuck is going on with this like Elon Musk Starlink thing where he said that like by turning off his satellite internet uh-huh. he stopped the he stopped an attack of basically Ukrainian drone submarines destroying the Russian naval fleet in Sevastopol. And look, the, the I, I think Matt, your inclination on this when we when, did, when discussing it was correct. Is it like any story with Elon Musk just assume it isn't true? Full of shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, and then the Walter Isaacson biography is like there's a lot of that's getting a lot of coverage too. That like he seemed to let this slip in a Washington Post excerpt over the weekend. And what I will say is, if it is true. Cheers to comrade Elon Musk for uh, throwing a yeah. wrench in the spanners of the American military industrial complex. Yeah, Cheers to, to the American military industrial complex for not immediately killing him for doing that. I mean, how if this really happened, how can there be a, a meaningful deep state? How is there anything besides a bunch of bureaucrats just doing their jobs and no coordinating intelligence? How do you let this happen? The only explanation is, yeah, you privatize everything. And with privatization came a real lack of capacity and power that you can't even though you still have the formal structures they don't uh they're not invested with the same capacities because you fucking auction them off and now this gomer can go out there and just be like hey yeah i'm your only access to these battlefields and i'm going to make a decision on what to do on them and ha- have them be able to make like oh yeah you gotta die we're, we're, we're gerard bullying your ass right now and it's not like they'd even have to kill him. Like he's the most overexposed guy on earth. There could be a they could margin call his ass uh, with a snap of a finger, and yet he's still out there doing this. And even if he is lying, they're letting him go out there and say he did this. It's not so much that he's lying as much as he's like most generously, I could say he's stretching the truth. Because as far as I understand, um, this was like twenty drones that like. Um, the Doge Avi guys bought online. This wasn't like a critical mass of like good deep state drones. This was like um, oh, drones you okay. could buy so on it's like some Enthusiastic amateurs trying to go along. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, it's like if this was not even like the Dulles Brothers show. If James Baker was still here, you know, Elon would be found. Uh, you know, autoerotic asphyxiation. Yeah, how <laughs> hard would that be? How hard would it be to kill this guy in a way that, that would be plausible that he died that way? Well, it, it, that's what makes the military budget so offensive. It's like yeah. I'm supposed to I'm supposed to be invested in this and you won't e- like you won't even kill him. Right. You won't even do this. 
you're still giving him contracts. It's like, oh, this thing's just a giant money spigot that re- that sprays money at uh, interested parties and rentiers, and that's it. That's all it does. It's just an on-off switch. Cool. Good luck making democracy with that. And you know, it it, it provides a good opportunity. I mean, because. You know, Elon Musk, isn't he like probably the biggest government contractor in the world for the U.S. military? I mean, he's one of them. And, and, and state. his yeah. whole edifice is powered by that. Just like with fucking Bezos, where the only thing he has that actually makes money is the fucking government contracts and the web services. The only thing, the only real cash flow going into any of Tusk, Tusk business is government fucking contracts. Sure shit isn't the cars or anything else. Yeah. And like, you know, like similar with Bezos, like you begin, you, you know, you begin to ask the question like, oh, like he has all these government contracts. Like, why don't they pull them or, you know, like wrap his knuckles or something? And I think at a certain level of government contracting, it begins to get like hazy as to who's the government and who's not anymore. Right. Exactly. And like, you know, but, but with Musk now, I mean, like this provides him a good opportunity to, I don't know, p- promote a kind of like, you know, a, his his vision of global leadership or like, you know, oh, I don't want I don't want Starlink contributing to war or death and like, you know, at least at least uh, portray what seemingly is a moral stance. But I, I just I really wonder uh, if the country in question were you if the country in question was not Ukraine and Russia, but anything to do with Saudi Arabia, what he would have done. Like, you know what I mean? Like, hmm. like, with, with, like what the Saudis are doing with Twitter. I mean, both before he was took over the company and certainly now that it's X or whatever. Like you think of like if Starlink was going to be used to like I don't know uh, shoot some migrants crossing a border and the Saudis wanted to use it to do that you think he would turn off the juice I highly doubt it well no it's because he's part of an emerging and sort of unselfconsciously spontaneously organizing extractor revolt against global capitalism that includes private actors like Musk and also governments like Saudi Arabia's that are pushing against a a greater American-led power formation that they are increasingly seeing individually is against their interests. and But they can't coordinate because they're fucking lumping forces, so they just act independently. They push against it and by so doing form this unconscious block now. Uh, and yeah, it's, 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 it's the homeowners association revolt uh, against global capitalism. I guess the other highlight from the uh, like the Walter Isaacson book is the revelation that fucking uh, like the like the, the new names of his fucking kids with Grimes, including one that was first like, of all I didn't I thought he had one didn't know about well, yeah this dude two. loves having kids he loves having kids well yeah because he's got to spread his seed because he's such a yeah. fucking genius no but like one of the kids names is a uh, techno mechanicus or something techno like that mechanicus epic Ugh. just just fuck Mixing you Latin just, and Roman fun. just fuck you. <laughs> He's, it's see, the thing is, is that he's epic and there are amazingly people who see him and his opposition to global capitalism, however they conceive it or he does as, oh, this guy is a, an ally in like some populist battle against capital. But he's a complete moron who privatization and neoliberalism has allowed to achieve this insane position of autonomous power. And he's going to use it like the dumb baby he is. He's not going to use it constructively. He can't. If he could, he wouldn't have it. They only gave it to him because of what the system selects for, which is the most empty headed and hearted freaks on earth. I guess like the other bit of news over the weekend, a uh, bit of celebrity news. Um, has anyone's PR department fucked up worse than Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis? And now I say that, mm. but then I remember that their PR department is probably the Church of Scientology. So when like other other people might advise you, it's a bad idea to write a, ju- a letter to the judge on behalf of your friend, the rapist. Uh, they just decided to go ahead with it. I'm guessing maybe because the Church of Scientology has some dirt on them. But did you actually read the letter that Ashton Kutcher wrote to the judge in this case? No. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty yeah. good. It's pretty yeah. incredible. So my, my favorite part is like um, where he's like um, any time that uh, we would meet someone who was on drugs, dealing drugs or uh, saw drugs, he would tell me that we were going to avoid that person forever. And that's what <laughs> made me the guy I am today. Yeah. Uh, it says here, uh, my name is Ashton. K- Dear Judge uh, Olmedo, I am Ashton. My name is Ashton Kutcher. I'm an actor, investor, philanthropist, and most importantly, a father. I met Danny Masterson when I was 20 years old in 1998. He instantly became a friend, dedicated coworker, and role model to me. He has remained as such for 25 years. 
And then he goes like, yeah, like he talks about like he saved him from a life of uh, being a Hollywood drug addict because he like he says, I'm grateful to him for that positive peer pressure. I attribute not falling into the typical Hollywood life of drugs directly to Danny. Anytime that we were, we were to meet someone or interact with someone who was on drugs or did drugs, he made it clear that he wouldn't be a good person to be friends with. <laughs> and like, I, I you remember his character on that 70s show was the pothead. So, so he's uh, advertising a, a, a drug, a drugged up lifestyle as something funny and cool, but, uh, you know, denying that behind the scenes. They never <laughs> actually show them smoking weed. They just show them in a circle and they're kind of like, going, ha, 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 and you're just supposed to think that they just like doing that. That has nothing to do with drugs. So you can't say that he was the pothead. He was the sitting around in a circle head. <laughs> Uh, we've spent hundreds of hours working together. Danny takes his job seriously. He is kind, courteous, and hardworking. He treated everyone from the grips to the teamsters to the actors and to the caterers as equals. He showed up on time all the time and always pulled his weight. It's like, okay, it's like wait, a, wait, he did, okay. I have to say, it doesn't cut. seem like he's trying that hard here. Yeah, like every, no. I know everyone's mad at him, and this probably is kind of the best he can do. Like, if you put a gun to Ashton Kutcher's head and it's like, you know, your friend raped these people and he's going to get 30 years in prison, you have to do the best possible job to, like, you know, grant leniency from the judge. This kind of probably, this would be the best he could do. But maybe if I was him, if I was Scientology and, like, you know, working the PR angle, I'd be like, look at how bad this was. He wasn't crying at all. <laughs> yeah, His, it does. Hey, hey, my friend raped five people, but he was never late to that seven right. show. Yeah, it sounds, like, it, it sounds like uh, a it sounds like they did a control replace in a uh, letter of recommendation for someone to be manager of a FUD Ruckers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. This isn't like this isn't enough to like get somebody out of a prison sentence. This isn't enough to like get somebody out of a halfway house. Yeah, this isn't enough to get somebody out of jury duty. Yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe this is like a like a double agent situation where by writing a letter so annoying, he actually got an extra 10 years on his sins. Uh, no, the other really good one that goes. Uh, yeah, he has always treated people with decency, equality and generosity. After 9-11, Danny was a huge mm -hmm. advocate for support of firefighters affected by the event, rallying his friends and coworkers to pitch in however they could. Danny had his daughter a year before I had mine. He set a st he set the standard of being a hands on dad. Uh, but yeah, nine eleven affected him very personally, as it did really affect all of us very personally. So I'd like to I'd like to just get that on the record now. Should I ever potentially be charged with the crime or facing imprisonment for anything, I'd just like the judge to know here and now before any crime has been committed. I was deeply affected by nine eleven, and uh, my brother in law is in the FDNY. Well, yeah. Um, one thing. Uh, one thing he did do was he um, convert tried to convert all the firefighters to Scientology. <laughs> like he, yeah, uh, he, he, he. Um, Scientology and Danny Master said they uh, they had these detox centers in New York right after nine eleven. Yeah, where the firefighters would come in and they'd be like, no, no, like. Um, don't take these things your doctor prescribed you. Take these vitamins and uh, let's get you on this OT meter. And, you know, we'll take care of it. I would assume that, like, most of those guys probably died of, like, the weird 9-11 illness, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, that may be true, but New York City had the clearest fire department in the country. And we're still, we're still proud of that to this day. Can't take that away. Well, actually, um, sp speaking of 9-11, to go back to 9-11 for a second, uh, New York Magazine has a, f a, a you know, a, a, we've, this is something we've been talking about recently, but New York Magazine has put together, you know, an, an, another sort of roundup of, so what is Rudy Giuliani up to these days? And I think it's actually a, a perfect to dip into this uh, on the anniversary of 9-11. Because, you know, I think we talked about this like two episodes behind, two episodes, a couple episodes ago. For a guy to fall that far in national esteem, like it is truly astounding because like he's probably not even invited to any of these 9-11 things anymore. I mean, and if he is, the camera is not being focusing on him and he's not being asked to speak or anything. And honestly, I would say, well, you know, at least he's got the love and loyalty of, you know, 30 uh, percent of the population. But I don't ever really get the sense that like MAGA people really like Rudy. No, like that yeah. nobody really seems to rally to Rudy. He's not like a real media fixture uh, beyond being interviewed all the time you know like he's 
I don't think his podcast is terribly popular. <laughs> Mark yeah. Meadows and Peter Navarro get all the love from MAGA world. Where's the love for Rudy? Rudy is like Trump's Memphis bleak. Except like <laughs> Jay-Z would pay Memphis bleak's legal fees. Yeah, he wouldn't be like, here's a GoFundMe. Oh, man. Uh, but uh, so in addition to uh, getting sued for sexual harassment and uh there's there's some there's some other details in here like uh it says here Giuliani often demanded this is of uh the the woman suing him for sexual harassment Giuliani often demanded that she work naked in a bikini or in short shorts with an American flag on them that he bought for her <laughs> and that he had her perform oral sex on him during business calls including when he was speaking to Trump because it made him feel like Bill Clinton it's good to know that his vision of himself in office as he, you know, burrowed through American political institutions and, and his dream of himself as president was just Homer Simpson on the porch twirling the pistol on his <laughs> finger while Marge yeah, yeah. did the fucking frug in a bikini with a monocle. That's just it. That was what he thought of. Why are you going to be president, Rudy? So I could do that. I'll do it. I'll rob the quickie mart. I like that he bought her the pair of short shorts with the American flag print. That's on very the considerate yeah. of him. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, he, he is, uh, what is he? He's been raising money via cameo. Uh, mm. it says here, the, the service that allows people to commission personalized videos from celebrities. This quickly generated new controversy when he recorded a video that appeared to endorse the case against his own legal client. Many other video appearances were personally embarrassing, though there is little chance they'll result in more legal trouble. <laughs> in 2022, Giuliani accidentally posted a video of himself promoting cameo in gigantic shorts. He also appeared on The Masked Singer, performing Bad to the Bone. His unmasking prompted co-host co Ken Jong to walk off the set in protest saying, that's right, I'm Ken. done. Yeah, I'm done. Oh, that, that was it? That, that's when you had your fill of The Masked Singer, Ken? I still don't understand that concept of that show. They sing in the masks and yeah. then people guess who they are, yeah. implying that people should be able to recognize Rudy Giuliani's singing voice. I broke a thousand hearts before I met you. And I'm done. I break a thousand more babies before I am through. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If somebody, if somebody I knew like was able to within 10 seconds identify like Howie Long by his singing voice, <laughs> I would kill them. <laughs> It's I would just, immediately not, I would call the police and be like, um, I'm killing my friend and this is why. And they'd be like, okay. you literally can you by hearing the voice, you can essentially nail it down to man or woman. And then you <laughs> yeah, got to like, just guess. It just doesn't I seem just, like a very realistic ge the game show part of it just doesn't make sense. You know, I uh, from the first Jenny McCarthy about it <laughs> from the fear from the fear for, from the first few bars of trouble from the music man. I knew that that was former NFL defensive end Warren Sapp. <laughs> yeah if you could yeah you i mean if you could do that you're either like an incredibly like schizophrenic person who's like cobbled together clips of this person like doing karaoke or something or like i don't know just the worst superpower ever like the x-men when they started running out of ideas <laughs> i uh, i also I, I saw i saw i saw a couple good uh like a, a pre like commercials for TV shows that are coming up now. Like this is this is what the, the networks are doing um to deal with the writer's strike. I saw a commercial for a TV show, a game show hosted by David Spade, the concept of which is that contestants have to guess whether a product is real or fake. And it's just like like all the all the harebrained products that they pitch on fucking Shark Tank, most of which I think are probably fake anyway. It's like they'll they'll do those and they'll be like, oh, it's a suitcase that looks like a dog or something. And then you're like, you're supposed to guess whether the product is real or not. And then the other one I saw, I was they were putting this one heavy uh, during all the uh, sports yesterday. Uh, a competition like a competition based game show uh, hosted by Josh Dumahel called Buddy Games. And you, and you that just, sounds you do, like a movie that uh, <laughs> Mind of Jason would watch. <laughs> yeah, but he, and it's just, yeah, it's like you just do like cornhole and ping pong with your friends. This, you cannot, <laughs> it's, yeah, these are, yeah, it's good. These are only fun to do because <laughs> yeah, they're by yeah. amateurs. They require minimal skill. That's what makes them fun and not like a rigorous test of the body and spirit, which is what like real sports <laughs> are, which is why they're fun to watch. They're, they're, they're broadcasting pickleball on television. Oh, yeah. It's like I this is yeah. standards have fallen in sports entertainment. You cannot deny it. I God, this is a country that has killed 
millions of people <laughs> in a really short period of time. Like, yeah. damn. I would imagine if America knocked over your government and then you watched buddy games. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing 9-11 doesn't happen every day it's uh, i mean we started doing it to ourselves just because nobody else would yeah <laughs> this um, is demoralizing uh you, you say that but uh you won't be feeling that way after you buy a pair of 50 dollar rudy giuliani sandals great products yes. at reasonable prices use code rudy for additional savings and it's just a, a photo that just says new sandals regular price 80 dollars, but you can get these sort of uh what? you know uh slip flip flops for fifty dollars use promo code rudy fifty dollars fifty dollars for sandals if you buy those sandals you should just have your entire accounts expropriated because you cannot be trusted with money that thing's got to be five cents worth of chinese plastic uh and my favorite one of what rudy's been up to is insisting that he doesn't have a drinking problem <laughs> uh, it says Giuliani denying reports sure. that a drinking problem is to blame for the shift away from his America's mayor persona and that he's talked to reporters while inebriated. Quote, I don't think I've ever done an interview drunk. I mean, I drink normally. I like scotch. I drink scotch, he said. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm a functioning. I probably function more effectively than 90% of the population. I like that he started to say I'm a functioning alcoholic <laughs> and just said I function better than probably 90% of the population. I function uh, better when I've had a few. That's what he's saying. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but yeah, like, you know, it's like kind of similar to Brett Kavanaugh saying, I, li I like beer. I drink beer. And, but he's he saying it's a scotch. A problem. He has a drinking solution. Yes, that's right. And uh, one of the other things he was doing, uh, shaving in an airport restaurant. It says Rudy Giuliani's personal grooming habits are already the stuff of legend, but he topped himself on August 22nd, 2021, when he was spotted shaving his face in the Delta One Lounge at JFK Airport. Traveler Nick Weiss shared footage on Instagram of the former mayor, of the former mayor eating a bowl of lobster bisque being, on a, being served a plate of brownies, uh -huh. then pulling out an electric raver, razor and shaving at the table using his tablet camera as a mirror. Weiss said that what made the incident even more bizarre was that the lounge had a really nice bathroom. <laughs> he just wanted to live that hobo life. Yeah. Well, uh, but best of luck to Rudy. I mean, this is, I mean, it's really like, this is his birthday, really. This is his day of special it's days. True. And I, 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 I hope he's having fun. I hope he's doing something fun. I hope he's treating himself to like a glass of scotch. Ah, <laughs> As he, yes, a yeah. couple. Yeah, as he then, <laughs> as he yeah. prepares to be deposed under oath for the uh, ten hundredth time today. That's true. Yeah, get a little Dutch courage and go in there and tell him what for. Give him hell, Rudy. Give him hell, just like you did the nine eleven hijackers. <laughs> I mean, he certainly did it to the nine eleven survivors. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, next up, I, I have a story uh, from the New Yorker. About um, basically the like uh, the the daring new frontiers in education, and uh, it, it it touches on a topic that we we enjoy talking about, uh, virtual reality and the metaverse, folks. That is the, oh, the, no. the charter school Fuck of the future off. will be in uh, in virtual reality. Wow, what year so, is I mean, this? Th this is an incredible. Th there's some incredible stuff in 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 this piece here. Uh, it just begins. It's six a.m. A little girl who looks to be about ten years old hits the button on her alarm clock. She eats a bowl of cereal and brushes her teeth and hair before going to school. In class, she takes notes while her teacher, Mrs. Marty, gives a lesson. Then everyone puts on space suits and helmets and the class relocates to outer space. This is the vision for a new kind of education sold in a promotional video for Optima Academy Online, an all-virtual school that was launched in 2022. The little girl, like most of her classmates and teachers, spends a good part of her day in a MetaQuest 2 headset, a set of one-pound white goggles that extends in a single band across her eyes. She wears the headset on and off for about three hours, removing it to read a book, eat a sandwich, and hot glue some sort of tinfoil art. Her classmates are scattered across different towns, and her teachers live all over the country. In the video, the little girl doesn't have a single in-person interaction. The virtual school is part of Optima Ed, a company in Florida, of course, founded by Erica Donalds, a 43-year-old conservative education activist. During the past school year, the academy enrolled more than 170 full-time students up to the eighth grade from all over Florida, a number that Optima Ed will roughly double this fall. Uh, so basically, it's just, yeah, like um, 
it's like a all all MetaQuest goggle school thing. But the interesting thing here is that this is all being promoted by uh, not just like charter school activists who want to destroy public education, but by like a specific kind of conservative education activist who wants to like return to the classics, but do it in a, a, a virtual world, to do it in a video game. Cool. So you get to like shank Julius Caesar? Yeah. Is that a mini game? It, this is literally history? Eat Who I Eat. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds fun, honestly. Sounds better than it? Oregon fucking trail, which is what I had. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, no, no slander about Oregon trail, please. That game was no, awesome. but I mean, now I'm, I'm just imagining Oregon trail, you, actually, you know, the eight bits, just the little musket balls, just languidly going across, trying to get the, to the bison versus like, you're actually holding a 3d, uh, fucking, um, black powder rifle and blowing away a, a thundering Buffalo. Come on. You t- taste it. I want to feel what it's like to have dysentery. I want to yeah, feel exactly. that. I want to shit thing. out my virtual doo-doo ass. Uh, I just think the interesting thing here is like both the connection of uh, Ron DeSantis, who has uh, uh, expanded this program by making all stu- students eligible for education vouchers funded that, but from, with money that would otherwise go towards public school education. So, yeah, you can get a voucher now in Florida. You just stick some vir- VR goggles on your kid and send them to Optima Ed. But it's I just here. I feel kind of vindicated here because when all this fucking metaverse bullshit first rolled out, everyone agreed this will never catch on. I'm sorry because it's unpleasant. And no one wants to do it. Only like the most leading edge case freaks find anything appealing about this. And I said, I don't know. It's yes. No one's going to choose to do this, but eventually there's going to come a part where you are made to do it. And who the hell in the world can you make do something like go to the metaverse children? Yep. They're the School only people kids. that you can make go to the metaverse. And if you're their parent homeschooling them, or if you're some overworked public school teacher carrying out the module that like your local school uh, district uh, heads got a kickback to put into the classrooms, you're going to now be in there as a kid. And then maybe when you uh, get older, you stay there because it's all, you know, but this is the way to make the metaverse an actual thing is start with the people who you can actually make go there, no matter how much it sucks. Because they yeah, don't know like, no better, and you can tell them what to do. Yeah, I feel I feel bad for kids the most in this because, like, yeah, not only is it going to be foisted on them first, it's foisted on them with this ethos of like, oh, the metaverse, you love this shit. I bet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, you do you love computers? I bet I bet you love uh, graphics from twenty years ago on a game. <laughs> yeah. I bet you hate legs. Yeah. <laughs> I feel it's no, still, like, yeah. They get the yeah. They're. Like Felix, I mean, I was thinking, like, how is this going to work on kids when, like, they're they're used to these like immersive open world gaming experiences with like 1080p graphics? Yeah, it, I, it's that's the most annoying thing about it, right? Is the metaverse is like an old person's idea of how a game or any type of computerized experience could be immersive, right? Like, yeah. the, the the most immersive games aren't like something where you put a fucking stupid helmet on and watch like a, a shitty, like basically just stretch a steam deck across your head. It's <laughs> yeah. like, it immerses you in the same way that like, honestly, like good TV shows and movies do like you, you connect on an emotional level. It isn't just like, Oh, we're replacing your entire field of vision with just this thing. <laughs> <laughs> like that's uh, like, that could maybe trick, not even an ape, like maybe a lesser monkey. It's just, it's so insulting. And like, yeah, especially like, yeah, kids who have already like experienced all these things. It's really shitty. Speaking of um, insulting apes, uh, Felix, I, I saw something recently about how zoos around the country at their gorilla enclosures, like, you know, where there's like a, yeah. like a clear, clear wall of glass. Zoos, at, like gorilla enclosures have to like put up notices now to not show the gorillas like videos on your phone of like TikTok and Instagram because they get uh, like they, they, it upsets them or they can like it can rile them up. And it just like it affects their brains in exactly the same way it affects ours because their yeah. brains are probably like 98 percent the same as ours. But like, I, yeah. I, I, I love that because I was just like. We're torturing apes, uh, either it, whether it's Elon Musk putting microchips in their heads or we're showing them fucking shit on our phones. that's bad for us. It's yeah. turning our brains into goop. But like, don't show it to the ape. Don't just leave, After, leave them yeah. untainted from the stink of humanity. 
after you sh- after you show them a phone video, they start going around and being like, if you see a banana with two brown spots on it, that means that you've been marked to be ape traffic. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, we, we introduced Twitter to the apes and they've given up bananas because we're not going to have them after the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> What's your job going to be after the revolution? I think mine is going to be flea picker. <laughs> um, sorry, back to uh, uh, Optima Ed, though. I just want to read this next paragraph and just keep in mind um, what they're talking about is putting a MetaQuest headset on a seven-year-old. Uh, Optima Ed builds its uh, its education as classical with an emphasis on the intellectual traditions of Western civilization and the liberal arts. Younger students learn phonics and diagram sentences. Older ones read the great books and the Constitution. Teachers talk a lot about virtues such as courage and self-government. It's a very traditional back to basics education, Donald said on a podcast recently. But like hey, it said, it said they're reading books and the Constitution. What in a fucking in 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 a VR headset? Yeah, you you roll you roll it out like a big parchment. Yeah, God, that's I already hated how they were like just forcing kids to use tablets. I fucking hate tablets. No one under the age of sixty five should use one. They're the, <laughs> just such a what an insult to the people who are you know, losing their lives, mining the materials we use for microprocessors uh, to, to make those garbage pieces of shit pointless. We have fucking, we have laptops that weigh like eight ounces. W- what are we doing with this? But tablets are way better than this. This is like, that is the worst possible way I could think of to read a book. That's it. Like one you word at a time. The, yeah. You retain the <laughs> least information possible. Like, okay, you get the experience of reading a book, but also like a, a painful audio visual experience. Oh, also, like why? I mean, I get why they're doing it now, because we still expect kids to learn how to read in school. But who knows? Like once you get a few generations of, of the cyber children, of the meta children, you might realize why well, they don't actually have to need to learn to read. And it really is. It kind of clashes with everything else in the the metaverse uh, uh pedagogical wheelhouse to have all this having to have to stop over these little symbols instead of just bomb bum rushing them with sensory overload because fucking print moves too slowly you know they're just gonna abolish it and then it will work perfectly well i mean like you know it's also part of the agenda to uh, not abolish not just public education but i think yeah like i think there is a movement afoot to abolish just education as a concept But uh, keep that in mind. Uh, Next paragraph here, it says uh, Donald's comes from the world of Florida school choice activism. She's well known in Florida political circles. A few of Donald's closest activist allies founded the group Moms for Liberty, which has become the leading conservative voice in the movement for parents' rights and education. And Donald serves on the group's advisory board. She's also married to a congressman, Byron Donald's, a rising star in the Republican Party, who was briefly a contender for Speaker of the House in 2023. The movement for school choice and parental rights sometimes dovetails with the classical school movement, which has been experiencing a revival in America since the 1980s. Whereas the former often focuses on the shortcomings of public schools, the latter offers an alternate vision for education, a way of teaching students that calls back to the ancient wisdom and traditions of the Western world instead of instructing them using progressive pedagogy and frameworks. I hate progressive pedagogy and frameworks. Get it out of here. Yeah, no, but like, oh yeah, educating k- k- children in the way in the ancient wisdom of the o- op- of the <laughs> ancient wisdom of the open world is what it's more like. Uh, but yeah, like just throw some throw some fuck. Play. This is just a video game. What the fuck is going on here? Wait, we got to integrate it- this with the uh, Prager U uh, yeah. cartoon uh, content <laughs> yeah. and just have you interacting with these shitty looking cartoon versions I- of Robert E. Lee, like. <laughs> That'll Matt, did you see the uh, the Prager U clip with Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Yeah, Grant? Yeah, just, like, was just oh, like, you was like, yo, we're boys. Yo, we just, we're boys. We got, we got just caught the, up on the wrong mix up sides. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, shucks. Lee was a good man. We had fought together in the Mexican-American War, but this time we were just caught on the opposite side of things. They also, like, I hated that one because they made Grant, who was, like, uh, an alcoholic who, like, had 20 kids and 15 of them died and like they just made him sound like a uh, soy conservative. Like he has the same speech patterns as like Seth Dillon. Yeah, I mean that's <laughs> the thing. These guys they want to they say they want to preserve history but they actually are trying to destroy it and create this fucking Disneyland version of it. 
that's I've noticed, uh, robbed of any meaning and flavor. <laughs> I've noticed actually a lot of like uh, sort of like neo Confederate accounts on Twitter now uh, will bring up uh, Ulysses Grant's alcoholism as like he was a degenerate drunk compared to the man of pure virtue, Robert E. Lee. And I got to say, yeah. check the rings. Yeah, check the rings. Scoreboard. Yeah, it, reminds Scoreboard. Me, it reminds me of when uh, John Jones and Daniel Cormier in their rematch, Cormier was uh, prodding Jones for having uh, been, I think, the first uh, UFC champion to ever test positive for cocaine residue in a fight that he won. <laughs> and he said, yeah, well, I, I beat your ass after a weekend of doing coke. <laughs> yeah. Same thing. Um, uh, well, well, actually, like let's let's talk about like uh, what's actually in uh, the Optum Academy online. It says there are about 250 custom environments in which students and teachers can gather for lessons. These places do not exist in real life. They were built by Optum Ed staff using virtual furniture, buildings, and natural environment el- natural elements. This is one of the things Optum Ed sells. Independent schools, for example, can pay to have access to these custom built environments. According to Donalds, Jeb. Bush, the former governor of Florida and an early school choice promoter, was wowed by his virtual school demo, asking with wonder, where is this? Nowhere, Jeb. It's nowhere. <laughs> so they've wowed Jeb Bush. This technology has blown the, the fucking socks off of Jeb Bush. Uh, uh, this MacBook being, Pro, baby. <laughs> this being a classical virtual reality school, Optimus environments include settings in ancient Greece and Rome. Okay, I don't think we should be putting kids in an ancient Greek and Roman setting for schooling. No, for I thought we were trying to various, not I thought we were them. starting to end that. We're trying to, moms trying to get grooming. that out of schools. Yeah. Today we're learning about frottage. <laughs> I was a motion. I was a motion capture actor for that. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do some terrible things. He plays he plays a body Thracian. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it says, OK, uh, recently, the head of the online academy, Dan uh, Sturvedent, and its academic dean, Kim Abel, took me on a tour of an early Roman outpost. The images are closer to an animated video game than to documentary footage. We teleported past a Roman official's house decked out with red clay roof tiling up some stairs to an open patio of black and white checkered marble floors surrounded by ionic columns and an ivy covered railing. Here, a teacher might spawn a set of bleachers for students to sit during a lecture on a subject such as history or Latin. The head of the virtual school's history department, Jonathan Olson, has a PhD in American religious history and is responsible for verifying the historical fidelity of the ancient sites, bleachers notwithstanding. Okay, why would you expose your, why would you give your kid this kind of education when you can just buy them the Assassin's Creed games, which, which provide an excellent education in all sorts of ancient historical environments? Yeah, how, how many neck snappings can you do in this bullshit? I think zero. Yeah, again, I mean, like, I hate pretty much every Assassin's Creed that came out uh, really after the first Obama term, but like they're more immersive than this bullshit. Like I'm struck by them using the term animated video game. What other type is there? (laughs) (laughs) Like, yeah, that assures me that this is just top of the line, incredibly immersive audio visual technology. It's animated. (laughs) Fuck out. Uh, toward the end of the school year, I joined a sixth grade science class on a field trip to an Everest base camp. The scene was elaborately staged. Our, this doesn't sound like classical education. This is like, uh, oh, here, here's what Mount Everest looks like if you were standing underneath. I mean, this is, they're not, where are the kids going to drill on just Greek pure, and Latin? It's just pure spectacle sensation, no context. So then nothing can make sense. You can't like keep it in your head as anything. Just it's these discrete experiences. And then it's like, it's good enough for you because nobody who's matters kid is going to learn this way. Yeah, no, this is only for the invisible people's kids. This is yeah. like, this is like if they took what they did to uh, Alex in Clockwork Orange and we're like, mm-hmm. it's a new learning experience. Stop it, stop it, please, I beg you. It's a sin. It's a sin. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it makes you fit to, uh, to take things from one place to another. God, what a fucking, it's so grim how we, we like teach the kids of our CVS employees and Uber drivers. Like yeah. you, here, you're like the backbone of this horrible, shitty system that it is near its apex of exploitation. But guess what? Your kids get a shitty tablet and now 
an onerous overheating helmet that uh, lasts <laughs> EverQuest at them that you have to pay for. Uh, yeah. It's great. Uh, Timmy's doing gr- uh, wonderfully in class. Uh, bad thing is, is that his invisible friend is Oscar Durlwanger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have great news. We've almost completely eroded the part of your son's frontal lobe that uh, produces empathy. <laughs> Uh, the teachers had set up a, a set of weather station equipment that a researcher might use, such as a compass and a barometer. The kids struggled with the lesson. When a teacher asked them where air pressure would be greatest on the beach or at the top of a mountain, they weren't certain how to answer. The session was chaotic. On a normal day, teachers might press a button and forcibly seat the students to prevent them from moving around during Jesus a lesson. Jesus Christ. Oh, but since God. this was supposed to be an interactive field trip, the kids were free to zoom around at will, which they did. One of them who had styled his avatar with a helmet walked right through me. <laughs> Roughly uh-huh. a dozen sixth graders were there, but it was hard to keep track with, of them with all the fidgeting. Okay. You know how, I, I mean, I, not to be too old fashioned here, not to be too back in my day, but I'd say if you wanted to teach a group of sixth graders how to use a compass or a barometer, you would just give, <laughs> show them a compass or a barometer. Not send them to this fucking d- 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 Mount Everest, Mount EverQuest fucking side, side mission to set up virtual weather equipment and, uh, to prepare them for a life of being gig Sherpas for a DoorDash <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. With the Jeb Bush thing earlier reminded me <laughs> that uh, Neil Bush, my favorite Bush brother. Yes. Uh, he made, he made like a small fortune in selling like bullshit education software. And like, I remember using stuff like that when I was like in grade school, like, uh, there were you there was like math blasters i'm sure people remember that but like most crucially those things did teach you very basic like multiplication and addition yeah and most importantly it wasn't horribly uncomfortable and you didn't get scolded for acting like a 9 year a 9 or 10 year old who's had a helmet forcibly placed on them that deadens <laughs> out all their other senses this is like this is terrible. This makes me so fucking sad. Get in the virtual demonic. veal crate, children. This is yeah. what it's like to be a veal calf. As it, yeah, as this is prepared that's, for that's slaughter. That fucking pearl, pearl jam. Do the evolution video. Remember yeah, that one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Put the Tom fucking stamps on the one kids of those goats, yeah. Yikes. This, this is yeah. some real the wall style shit right yeah. here. To forcibly uh, seat the kids oh, in VR. Oh. Jesus yeah. fucking Christ. Like, just kill yourself. Not if you're uh, the kids, little, if you made this, <laughs> fuck yeah. you. I hope just you fucking bit, die. A little bit more about the uh, virtual uh, ascent of Ever- Everest. It says here, in the next activity, we attempted to scale the Kumbu Icefall, which in real life is a deadly stretch on one route up Everest. The format was a cross between a quiz show and a video game. Using the teleport function on our handheld controllers, we moved along a line of chairs set up along the icefall, occasionally passing a floating note card with a review question. There was also a physical rule put in place. No one could move the controller in their left hand. Otherwise, they'd fall from the mountain and force the whole group back to base camp where we'd have to start all over again. At first, the students discussed the various dangers of the mountain. One suggested that we should all be quiet to prevent an avalanche, then started screaming to demonstrate what not to do. A teacher quickly muted them. (laughs) God God bless kids. Kids that will be kids. Yeah. That is the only bright spot in this thing that the kids are fucking this thing up every chance they get, which they should do. They absolutely should. Oh my God, yes. Yeah. The fucking controller. Anyone anyone who has subjected kids to this deserves the most unruly classroom possible. But it's like, so it's pitch is this amazing thing because it's interactive. Yet anytime anyone interacts with it, it just craters <laughs> and has to fucking yeah. restart because it's made yeah. as shoddily as possible. Wow. It's almost like you could just show them a fucking documentary if you were being that lazy. Yeah. It's almost like that's a better but, way of teaching yeah, just them. Slap, open get, palm, get the slap TV, the TV, roll the TV into the, into the class. Into the class. Television. Yeah. That is way less traumatic and mind warping than this shit. Yeah, like I honestly ever so it, from what it sounds like any time that like a kid moves at all like puts any input in they probably bill it as like oh no this is it's the same as like keeping order in a classroom you have to like well, yeah. you, right you but I think I actually think that it's so shittily made that it can't handle multiple inputs 
and it has to, it doesn't have like the video memory to handle that. So it has to reboot every time that it, it, it gets more <laughs> than like one thing put into well, it. Well, uh, uh, these discipline, you know, these discipline problems with kids uh, virtually moving and pressing the teleporter button when they've been frozen by the teleport controller. Uh, these disciplinary issues will soon fall away when Optima Ed in, uh, includes like sort of like a a dog collar that you can attach to yes. the MetaQuest yeah, goggles. I mean, easy it enough. delivers a small jolt, just a mild jolt mild of electricity but memorable shock. to the reticent student. Mm -hmm. just, just finishing up about the expedition up Everest uh, as the exercise got underway the kids grew increasingly frustrated my teleport's broken one of them shouted another one couldn't find the chair in the line up the mountain people must have been using their left hand controllers because the whole group kept falling and getting to reset at the beginning of the activity every time a pre-recorded message from one of the teachers would say oh man well, hopefully we won't make that mistake again. Several kids sped ahead of the rest of the group. It wasn't clear who was actually looking at the review questions. <laughs> Just last paragraph I want to read here. Afterward, when I asked Sturdivant about what had happened on the mountain, he described it as an opportunity for virtue development. There is a virtue in serving your peers well by not being a distraction, Sturdivant said. There's a virtue in having self-discipline and being able to control your emotions. Those are the follow-up conversations that we'll, we will have with the students. Uh, There's Mangana, a, you know what would be virtuous? If you went into your garage right now and just fucking gunned your car in neutral. <laughs> if you got into a bathtub and opened your wrists, you piece of shit. You fucking child it, torture profiteer. It, it, God, fuck it really, you. It really is evil. It really is unspeakably Kill yourself evil. Now. And like, and like all this, like, and, and you know, by the way, these people, uh, they have, they have, they have contracts or they have like deals in place uh, with uh, Hillsdale, the sort of like evangelical Harvard. What a shock. I think just like, all, all yeah. the, all the, all the schools where it just all, all the administration gets off on like disciplining and punishing children as much as possible. They love this shit. Were these, these were the same people that like during COVID were, were like, this is like horrible yep. for kids that they're being yeah. putting the masks on them. Oh my God. Right. Putting goggles on them. That's like, normal. Like to, to a point, it's like, I am sympathetic to a lot of that because like COVID was really bad for young people, like oh, yeah. awful, both like the anxiety and misery of COVID itself, but also like the isolation young people well, and, and losing like a year or two years of education yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. Yeah. Young people gave up a lot and it was really sad, but this is like, well, like they might as well just stay home. Like this is the same thing. You're taking all the socialized aspects away from learning. This is horrible. Like I think, and I like, think a Zoom school is like terrible. This is worse. This is way worse. Way worse. Oh, this is a million times worse. And like I, I think the thing that strikes me about all this is like, despite its uh, lofty aspirations and like association with like you know supposedly the supposed institutions of learning like Hillsdale, and this whole agenda of like classical education. Like okay, let, let, let's say that there is some virtual lesson plan where you get to like I don't know fall off Mount Everest fifty times and like look at little pop up questions or whatever. And then, like, when confronted with it, the guy, you know, uh, the, the stupid guy who should probably end his life, uh, what's his name, Sturdivant, um, he says, like, okay, like, rather than any imparting any lessons about Mount Everest, like, the country it's located in, how tall it is, like, when it was formed, you know, like, I don't know, like, uh, the, the, anything of cultural, scientific, or political interest about the history of Mount Everest, it's just like, oh, no, actually, the lesson was about virtue building. Like the virtue of uh, helping others and not being annoying. Yeah, uh, shutting your the, fucking mouth. I yeah. mean, like Shut what a mouth. what a fucking tell that is too. Because yeah. it, right, of course, there's Obedience. nothing. There, there's nothing like anyone. Anyone who's like ever sold like you know education software, like we talked about, at least had like a pitch where it's like, oh, well, if you do it in this, uh, if you gamify it in this way. It uh, makes people competitive about like learning facts or like multiplication tables or, or anything like that. There's like a pitch that's centered on the act of learning itself. But because this is strictly a tool of immiseration and discipline through sensory deprivation, he's he's like, no, this is about this is about learning to keep your fucking head down and prepare for yeah. the future of door dashing. And like the thing is, I remember being in sixth grade. Uh, like theoretically, some sort of like a uh, TV documentary or computer game virtual trip to Mount Everest would be very fascinating to like me to me as a sixth grader. I don't imagine like many other sixth graders because 
Kids are fascinated with things that are big and like there's interesting things you can teach kids. According to Sturdivant, he says here, there's a virtue in having self-discipline and being able to control your emotions. And then he says, uh, struggle is okay. Distraction is not. If there are ways in which the technology gets in the way, we'll correct those things. You, so should, like, str- you should struggle <laughs> with, a, with a sword jammed into your own stomach. And then maybe uh, the distraction can be ended by a friend beheading you after 30 seconds of bleeding. You need to commit Florida seppuku now. Uh, well, the, la- the last line I'll read from the article is it says at Optima's virtual school, Ryland has thrived. His mom said his parents work from home and they like having him around, especially because Ryland used to be so anxious about the school day. He doesn't have to worry about a school shooter coming in. Hill said he doesn't even have to worry about the drills anymore. Boy, oh boy. We really like, ah, you got me there, man. It's just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just touche. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh God. I detect I detect the vile phantom menace, the veiled hand of Zuckerberg behind this entire goddamn thing, because we look at him epically fake planting with meta and realizing, OK, nobody is going to choose to do this. Well, what about those people who can't choose to do anything? And if I'm not mistaken, Zuck is a huge school choice guy with a huge funding yes. network within school choice networks. So how hard would it have been for him to stand up? a couple of independent organizations moving towards this new results-based techno learning concept that, oh, it just so happens to use the meta platform <laughs> that, that nobody else wants to use yeah. by bribing the school districts. It's basically what they do. And then it becomes de rigueur and a whole generation gets inculcated and brainwashed into that way of living. And of course, this is a moment when we have this Titanic battle over brainwashing children about ideological capture in schools and meanwhile you have a literal war on like what it is to be a human being waged on (laughs) children uh the thing you're saying you're scared of but because it doesn't trip any fucking culture war triggers it doesn't hit any trip wires then it just is invisible and then it's just gonna happen and you're gonna have uh, uh kids the kids who don't really count because of course the voters and the policymakers, none of their kids are going to go through this. That's assumed. This is for somebody else's kids. And there's going to be two different modules, depending on which uh, party holds your state government. You're going to have the 1619 uh, woke module, and you're going to have the 1776 base module. And then you get to just not learn anything from any of yeah. it and just really just learn how to be a literal drone. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about like the the war on public education, and obviously, like that's a huge part of what's going on here. But as I said before, it's like there there is a war on the concept of education, and it's like under the guise of whether it's this like classical wink wink, really virtual education, or I don't know, like decolonizing the, the curriculum right. or whatever whatever shit yeah, that the, is. It's just a it's just a way to get to deliver this new way of being onto to, people to, to, to deliver like um yeah like to, to deliver things to kids that are like under the guise of education that are like <laughs> to destroy right. your mind and, and, and your will to live and the pitch and the pitch is no they have to learn the right things they have to learn the right values or else we're going to lose the culture war but they're not learning any of that they're not learning anything they're just learning to yes be obedient and to not recognize human connection if they fucking had any yeah, don't move, just, don't move the left controller, Matt. Don't move the left controller. Matt, you're going to reset. You're going to re, <laughs> you're you're reset us. You're going to take a, You're going to take us out of Gettysburg. <laughs> Hello, friends. It's Monday, September 11th. This is your Chapo coming out. You know, hope everyone is having a wonderful 9/11, um, and you know, just dancing, 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 dancing. That's what people do on 9/11, and it's what's trending on Twitter right now. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah I we have to like make this completely illegal within like mm-hmm. three years or yeah actually but like, Larry and Jihad it, time it, honestly yeah. beat him, it's it's go it, time with this if you can't beat them join them and I think we need to start our own Prager U and just start doing yep. our own like you know your virtual professor Matt Christman to take you around the Antietam battlefield Ooh, I think that, that would be, be great fun. for kids. We'd have fun to, to the to the sunken road. Yeah, you could tell them about all the people who died there. You could, yeah, the wheat get the field, fire up. Oh. If, yeah. if Burnside's bridge. If we're just like, because like this stuff isn't education, I would just, I would like to do a class where I teach the events of Elden Ring, like the, it's real history. That happens. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Listen, it doesn't actually matter. It's it doesn't matter. Yeah. The middle ages happened or if this happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, it's just hey. a fun story either way. Hey, Matt. 
According to virtual professor Gary Kasparov, the Middle Ages didn't happen. So <laughs> yeah. Check out Elden Ring. <laughs> Checkmate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Rome fell no, 20 I, honestly, years ago. I honestly, I feel like I think a virtual class and with like, you know, a series of lectures that you gave explicating like the entire lore of Elden Ring. It's better. Like they're not reading books in school anymore. That'd be better than most like, I don't know, English lit classes that they're teaching these days. That's. That's got that's that's uh, that's got story characters, you know, themes, tropes. There, yeah, there are like better morals in Elden Ring than there are in any of uh, this child torture device as it exists currently. <laughs> uh, well, uh, best of luck to Optima, yeah, good Optima luck. Ed, and uh, the, the proprietors of which, which uh, and good uh, luck to the children. Names and You're addresses. Need <laughs> uh, yeah, if um, what was the guy's name again? Uh, start event start event start event uh if you're schizophrenic and live in start events neighborhood <laughs> please hear these numbers 17 18 19 35 7 7 17 18 gray 49 70 70 108 108 9 0, 0 black <laughs> do what those numbers tell you i mean two 108s in a row i don't know what that means yeah yeah i yep 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 do what you got to do we just do not kidding. endorse any. We didn't. We, yeah, just kidding. These are all a joke. If you're a schizophrenic, please do not take this seriously. Seek help. Go leave Florida. <laughs> yeah, get the fuck out of there. Yeah, leave. Not good for you. Mm-mm. All right, boys. Leprosy. Let's uh, let's wrap it up there for today. Um, uh, before we go today, I just have a, a quick plug, um, and it is for uh, my boy Carl Stevens and uh, Russell Goldman. I have uh, he has uh, drawn a, a graphic novel called Mother Nature. That is based on a screenplay by a uh, horror legend, Jamie Lee Curtis, Hollywood royalty. So I'd just like to, if my uh, opinion on uh, funny books means anything to you, be it uh, Justice Warriors or, or or other other books I pitched on this show, I would just like to give a shout out to my uh, friend Carl Stevens' new book, Mother Nature, that he uh, did in collaboration with Russell Goldman and Jamie Lee Curtis. Uh, I will say about Carl, just 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 Google Carl Stevens. I'll include a, a link to the book. But he's an amazing artist, and I did just commission him to do a portrait of my dearly departed Marty, which uh, beautifully captures uh, my beloved cat. So uh, just a plug here for Mother Nature by Jamie Lee Curtis, Russell Goldman, and Carl Stevens. Check it out if you like graphic novels.